By intuition, I will speak the intuition of the spirit. I will speak the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, yes. yes. welcome to yes. yet another Record it because it can be replayed for... for so, today is... Uh, yes. 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 Today is Saturday, January 28, 2023. And welcome to this very yes. special edition. Um, celebrating the... Explosive. Day of St. Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas, angelic doctor. And we are doing this today because uh, right. Thomas Aquinas is the patron saint of the St. Thomas Aquinas Major Seminary in Bambui. I happen to have been in that seminary for six, seven years. Um, and today we want to, as part of the Golden Jubilee, the seminary launched its Golden Jubilee celebrations last December. And this week, today we are starting a series. And when I talk about we, I'm talking about the lay alumni of that seminary. And I'm very privileged to have a very, very formidable panel. I want to welcome all the brothers here, Professor JJ Asongu, Professor Valentine Galim, and of course, the very, very renowned Bawe Luis Tarao. So let us start off by introducing ourselves, and I want to start with the most senior person, I think it's Prof. JJ. Yeah, um, I, I, since you said the most senior, I think it should actually be Mr. Bawe. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's going, he's, going to, he's going to fold me on that, but just go on because I see his connection has a problem. Okay. Okay. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I think uh, uh, the fact that I went to St. Thomas Aquinas Major Seminary in Bambui is a significant aspect of my life. I usually tell people that I describe my life in two phases, uh, my life up to the point in Bambui and then after when I left. So that's how significant it is for me. It's uh, it was life changing. So uh, what do I do now? As a, a basic introduction, I've been all over the map. I uh, initially my interest was in academics after uh, in journalism after I left the seminary, and then I f went forward to. I even came to the U.S. and worked for some major news organizations, and then went forward into academics and I rose to the rank of an associate professor of business and then uh, went and started St. Monica University in Cameroon. And then, uh, or I would say in Boya, I hate the name Cameroon. And then I came back to the US after the civil war broke out or the war of independence broke out. And uh, upon returning here, I went into IT. Actually, I'd had an IT degree as far back as uh, 2002. And so I just went back to, to it. And today I am uh, thankful to God for the opportunities that I've had. And uh, I would say that I'm one of the leaders in the area of cybersecurity. And I consult for both the government and even some of the leading banks, global banks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Songu, and that's quite a journey. Many people think that uh, ex seminarians are just, uh, you know, teaching in Catholic schools. <laughs> it's a different experience. We can talk about that later. But thank you for the correction, and for the Morris is also welcome for the Morris, always present. Uh, but we entered bureau call before Prof. JJ, and so I understand why you are going there. And again, uh, Professor Valentine Galim. It's teaching yes. now, so the opportunity is yours. Let's hear about what you're doing. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. I am Valentine Banfuyangali, Chair of Philosophy in Higher Teacher Training College, the University of Bamenda. And I'm also a visiting lecturer in the Catholic University of Cameroon, Bamenda. So I am also mm -hmm. a lay ex seminarian from, uh, ba from STAMS. And that is why I'm part of the show today. And I think it was a privilege having an opportunity to study in this, uh, uh, let me say, renowned uh, institution. And that has also made a, a telling influence on the person I am today, which I won't pretend about it. And um, 
with my experience in Bambui, I have lots and lots of things to say. So my life in my life before Bambui, my life in Bambui, and my life after Bambui gives me a great inspiration to be able to contribute ideas on how I perceive the institution now and how I think it should be. So without much ado, I say this is all I have about myself. Technology. Thank you very much, and I'm um, very grateful. You forgot one very important point that you have to return to. Um, this is you are just elected to the prestigious association of uh, lay alumni of camps. Okay. As he's the current president, he just took over. I think um, we are not two weeks into office. Or two yes. Weeks. So we we'll come, we'll come back. To, yes, we'll, come we'll back be to coming you. back to that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yes. now we started off from the most senior person who I thought was Prof. JJ, but actually it is Luis Bawe. Brother Luis, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Brother Luis Bawe, can you hear us? So I think Brother Luis is having a challenge with his... Uh, uh, connections. I'll try to see what I can take him out and bring him back again. Um, so while we are going on, uh, uh, President Galim, can you just tell us a little yes. bit about the Association of Ex Seminarians, the lay oh, alumni? Oh, yeah. yeah, presently we are having an Association of Lay Ex Seminarians and it has been registering great strikes. I think we've been for the past three years because the first uh, people just finished a term of office and presently I'm the incumbent president who just took over a week ago and we are still tidying up the papers to continue with the activities of this uh, it's called it's, it's called Lasta and um, I think it's a privilege that brothers have given me to be able to captain this association and also contribute the little leadership skills I have for the well-being of this association. So, so thank you very much. And today I wanted to do three things before we go on. Today is the 70th birthday of the right Reverend Bishop George Nkuo. Bishop wow. George Nkuo gave me my first job when I left the seminary. He assigned me to teach in Christ the King College, Tico. And um, he's very close to my family. I want to say thank you. Happy birthday, Bishop George. And I have prepared a, a little uh, write-up for you that I'm going to send up. But one thing I want to talk about the bishop is on your 70th birthday, the words that I want to use for you are the words of the last, one of the last things that Pope Francis wrote, I think two years ago, when we we're celebrating uh, the anniversary of um, St. Joseph as father. He said, he wrote something with a father's heart. And I think that is the description of your ministry in Kumbu. You have, beyond doubt, demonstrated that you are a father. I talked to a lot of priests from Kumbu, and I just asked myself, one of the happiest presbyterates in the ecclesiastical province of Bamenda currently are the priests from Kumbu, and that is because of the kind of bishop that they have. You have a father's heart, and Bishop George, a very, very happy birthday. We, ex-students of Bambui, are very proud of you. Um, I want to also say that when you came to the United States, first after your, when you were made bishop, Dr. Nicola Starr proposed in front of his wife, he proposed to his wife in front of you, and you assigned for the Eugene Katete to be the chaplain of ex-seminarians at that time. So that those are two things we are going to take up. But I just wanted to wish you that ha very happy birthday. You are an, an alumni, you no, an alumnus of Stamps. So uh, you went on and became a priest, became a bishop. We did not make it. We also formed part of that family. I also wanted to say a happy anniversary to Bishop Bushu. Last week, Bishop Bushu celebrated his uh, golden jubilee in the priesthood. That was the third rector of Bambui. And uh, Professor Asongu has written a very good piece that I'm putting together too. That should be coming out in the days ahead. A very happy anniversary too to Bishop Bushu. Uh, congratulations for the time you spent in the seminary. I think 12 years in all. Um, he came to the major seminary in Bambu and taught for a few years and then went back to Rome. 
completed his doctorate in philosophy, came back and taught and became rector. I think he was rector for two, three years before becoming bishop of uh, uh, Yagua and then eventually bishop of uh, Boya. So congratulations to those two. But I also note that there's a brother, an ex seminarian a lay ex seminarian whose wife just brought forth a baby today. And the president is trying to name the baby Thomas Aquinas. And I have a challenge for the for the president because the president does not think that they should have named the seminary Thomas Aquinas. He wanted something else. We'll get to that conversation. So let's start off where we're supposed to, having cleared that out. Uh, so to the brother who just brought the, for the baby, I think it's Dickinson, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sorry if I'm calling that wrong. Congratulations on your baby. We You told us, Madam, the baby and, and yourself, you're all doing well. So bring welcome to the family. So let's start off. Professor Songu, what can you tell us about Thomas Aquinas? That's what we are here for. Um, since you mentioned my mentor and friend, uh, Bishop Bushu, he was my rector for almost all my time in the seminary. So um, I would uh, I would uh, introduce St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, starting with what he used to tell us. Um, I, I like calling him Pear Bush because that was the nickname we had for him. And I, I, for me, the nickname was fun. We saw, we saw him as a father figure, just like you mentioned about Bishop yeah. George. Okay, let me, uh, before I go too far, let me get back to, to Thomas Aquinas. This is what, this is my first introduction to Thomas Aquinas. It was from uh, uh, Bishop Bushu, then uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Bushu, who was our teacher and rector. He, when he introduced St. Thomas Aquinas to us, he told us that the guy lived just for 40 something years, but that, the achievements that uh, Aquinas did was such, uh, I mean, it was so great that if you brought 40 average scholars and make each of those 40 average scholars to live 40 times their lifespan, and then you collected all the works of those uh people and put together, they would dwarf in front of what Thomas Aquinas did. <laughs> so that can tell you how much uh, uh, Bishop Bushu thought about uh, Thomas Aquinas. And having uh, been uh, Bishop Bushu's student and listening to those, I can only tell you how revered I am of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, I, uh, but who is he, though? Thomas Aquinas was a, an Italian Dominican friar. That's a Dominican priest and a monk, a uh, friar. And uh, he uh, was a philosopher, one of the leading philosophers, as well as theologians, as well as one of the leading philosophers and theologians. And he wrote a number of books. I don't want to get into all of those right now, because I guess we'll have the opportunity to, to talk about them. But one of the most significant was the Summa Theologica. Uh, we also have uh, the Summa Contra Gentilis. We also have um, other works like the Treatise on Happiness, where it talks about uh, happiness being the summum bonum. We also uh, had his work on law, morality, and politics. And he also did some commentaries on Aristotle. In fact, uh, we believe that Thomas Aquinas was highly influenced by Aristotle as well as Augustine. Um, yes, so uh, that is briefly what I would say about uh, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. And uh, if asked, I think it was an appropriate name for uh, a patron saint for a seminary because uh, he's basically a saint and a scholar. And I think uh, the seminary should be a place to train uh, saints and scholars. I, I think that that is a good place because when you end up with saints and scholars, that is exactly yeah. why Bambui was named after St. Thomas Aquinas. And I think... All of us have read uh, Bernard Fonlon's open letter to the seminary, to the yeah. bishops. At the time, they were opening up Bambui. 
Um, he, he encouraged the bishops to ensure that the seminary in Bambui becomes a place where saints and scholars are trained. And I'm sure it is after that that they took that into consideration to name the seminary. But uh, Professor Valentine, you, you teach philosophy. You are chair of the Department of Philosophy. So what is it you can tell us in addition to what Prof said? And I like the analogy or the imagery that Bishop Bush will use to talk about Thomas Aquinas. If you had 40, 40 average people, you know, and each of them had to leave 40, that's four times four, you know, 40 times 40. That means the lifespan. That is why till today we, we keep talking about it. And just before I come to you, uh, Professor Ngali. Focus, that's an ex -Indian. Professor Songu. Nice seeing you again. I was in the refectory in Stamps when you spoke passionately about life out of the seminary. For those who didn't make it to the priesthood, as always, you motivate. So you motivated this guy to come out from the seminary. <laughs> That's sad. <laughs> <laughs> so, Professor Ngalim, what's your take about Thomas Aquinas? I, I don't know whether you're a Thomist. I mean, oh, yeah, clear. no. Uh, in the first place, uh, I have admiration for his great works. Thomas Aquinas, uh, but I'm not a Thomistic philosopher of that. Uh, and that is where I have a problem with Bambui itself. Um, Thomas Aquinas is a great angelic doctor who has written widely, has handled very interesting and controversial issues in philosophy. He has a great contribution to philosophy as an Aristotelian. I consider him more as an Aristotelian, and which means he falls under the school of the metaphysical school of, of realism, and uh, where ideas are true, independent of the mind. And um, in fact, in Bambui, we leave so much of his philosophy, but then I belong to the philosophical school of pragmatism, which is a combination of idealism and realism. And I think progressively, so I don't, I, I never steep myself so much into Kuhabar Aquinas, but I have read him because he, most of our metaphysics, epistemology, and theodicy were just Thomistic philosophy. And that is, it was both a strength because we were studying in a seminary that is named after him, but it was a very great weakness when I was out of Bambui and studying philosophy. I saw my philosophy to be very, very limited to Thomistic. And with my perspective now of a progressivist, I am thinking of a seminary beyond the Thomistic tradition. Because Thomas Aquinas gives us the philosophy of the medieval era. And if we understand the truths and the educational uh, practices in the medieval era, we would, we would see that uh, presently they have something to contribute because education, the history of education says that there is something that remains, the substance that remains, but then the accidents keep changing. But then, with what Thomas Aquinas is able to contribute, I am thinking that we also have to move away and grow to meet the exigencies of time. So I, I, that's what I, I, I can say about that. That, that is, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah, if, if you don't mind, let me, let me chime in. Okay. Um, right. I, I, don't, I don't know whether I consider myself <laughs> Thomistic or not. But I do not necessarily disagree with what uh, Professor Ngalima said. Uh, rather, I still think that uh, that he was, if you ask me if I had to vote, uh, there would be no second for the name. It would basically be Thomas Aquinas or nothing else. Because come to think about it, Thomas Aquinas, as he said, he was a child of his period. He was actually a medieval guy. He lived in the 12th century. And uh, even beyond just philosophy, Thomas Aquinas is seen as the bridge between the, uh, the ancient times and modernism. And he did contribute a lot to, to, uh, to, to, to knowledge. Basically, he's credited for separating philosophy from theology, from distinguishing between those two and all that. And so my admiration for Thomas Aquinas and thinking that, and like it's not that necessarily I agree with everything that he says, but I, I, I agree with the symbol that he is, that he represents. That, he, that he is that link between uh, uh, an ancient period and a ancient period 
and the, the modern world. period. And what I'm thinking is that people who follow Aquinas should be like him, not necessarily that because what he said in his days was new, was strange, and all that. And so today, I don't, I don't expect us to to just regurgitate the same thing, but I want us to have his spirit that we can now also contribute new things. So my admiration for him does not necessarily mean that we just say that knowledge ended with him, that there's nothing more to learn. No. <laughs> no I, I don't think that was, that's what Prof was either saying. But, uh, no, yeah, I understand. Dr. I was just... Dr. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Nicholas Starr, he says, good job, guys. Professor Ngalim, um, I am personally proud of you and your academic achievements. Keep educating the masses. You guys are classmates, so that's why you guys are praising each other, but that's okay. <laughs> And uh, he says, <laughs> I should have been part of this panel. Bomb. That is true. I absolutely. So again, like I said in the beginning, this is a beginning. This is the beginning of a series. This is a series that we're going to be doing throughout the year. We are just starting it. And I'm seeing that there's a lot of excitement about it. And uh, but President Gali, you said something interesting, that you are a progressivist. And yes. within the church circles, that doesn't sit well because it means that you are you have moved away from the conservative thoughts of uh, Thomas Aquinas, you know. And I'm wondering, are you in effect? Well, the one thing one can appreciate is the fact that Bambui St. Thomas Aquinas Major Seminary laid a base for you, and maybe is good for the formation of priests. But outside, as an ex-seminarian, you it seems as if you need more than just Thomas Aquinas. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Both for me and even those in Bambui now, they need more beyond Thomas Aquinas. Because uh, when I say I'm a progressivist, yes, I acknowledge the fact that there are values that are, ever, that are perennial, everlasting, that we will find in the tradition of, 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 of the writings of Thomas Aquinas. That's that why I talked about the substance. But then with the, with the changes in time, there are the, the, the accidents on that change so there is a need to take these values and fit them into the systems as they progress. Because I don't want a, a, a static situation. I want it to be dynamic. And that's the perspective in which I'm looking at Bamboo Seminary now. I see them to, still living. They have a lot to contribute, but um, mm, they are very static to my perception. I am expecting a dynamic Bamboo Seminary especially the one that is living to the, to the challenges that we have today, even the pastoral challenge, ch challenges that we have. So thank you. I'll come back to that. We are, let's try um, our most senior brother here, Bora Luis Bawe. Are you, are you on now? Can you hear us? Bora Luis. Luis, can you hear us? Say something. I, I I am open please. Yes, there, okay. There's light failure here, please. Can I talk for that in case light go up? Get it. Go on, go on. Just introduce yourself and tell us about your experience with Thomas Aquinas. Yes. We have power failure here. So I, could you give me a chance to talk before it goes off again? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, I'm I'm good evil. Well, Luis, we are waiting. Just go ahead. Just talk. Introduce yourself. Do, I don't do, know do, what do, I can do, 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 yes. I'm listening to you. I'm going to you. Can you introduce yeah, yourself? I'm going to you. Yes, I'm back now. Yes, I'm back now. Yeah, power failure. I don't know what is going on. That's uh, typical. But I also wanted to say Father Wilfred Pierre, a man says, Valley, good to see you again. I'm sure you know Father Wilfred. But I will oh, yeah. with uh, a PhD in uh, public policy uh, last oh. December. So he's also saying congratulations. So I don't know, Raluis, I don't know. Are you back? Can you hear us? Can you say something? No, his phone is back. Okay, he's so not we have a problem. Again, we have a problem with that. So now let's let's get back to, to the conversations. So I'm wondering, why do you, I mean, aside from the fact that you had Bernard Fonlon writing a letter about making the seminary saints and scholars, and possibly that's the reason why the bishops chose Thomas Aquinas to be the patron saint of the seminary. 
and we just heard both of you share your experiences with that. One of the things I've, I've often regretted is I don't think we have enough of Thomas Aquinas in Bambui. I don't think we really have enough as a patron saint of the seminary. Outside the 28th of January every year and outside the philosophy department, which is no longer even a part of Bambui now because they have moved it over to uh, John Paul II uh, Seminary in Manfi. I'm wondering how Thomas Aquinas was reflected in your days, is reflected now, and should be in Bambui. Uh, the, the, okay. Can, 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 I, can I chime in uh, again? Uh, sorry, to, I just wanted to, to add something that I remember hearing. I was made to understand that the name Thomas Aquinas was not selected by the bishops. It was actually selected by the students. I was... Uh, remember the campus for St. Thomas Aquinas Major Seminary uh, had been uh, a teacher's training college and it was a St. Peter's teacher's training college. So I was told that, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, it was in one of the discussions in Bambui around the feast. Uh, I may be wrong, I don't want to be quoted, but maybe it was Father Viban who said so. Uh, I may be wrong again, but uh, I was told that the first batch that when they came or they uh, around the first generation, they, the official name of the seminary was simply Regional Major Seminary. So the students now wanted to they, they wanted to have a, a patron saint, and the choice was actually between Peter and <laughs> Thomas Aquinas because Peter, given that the the campus was already a Saint Peter, and then there was uh, I don't know who came out with the idea, but the students voted for that. And the students at that time voted and they, they went. So it looks, it's one of those rare things where, <laughs> where they give students uh, the opportunity to contribute to their future. And I'm glad, I mean, I have no, I mean, I'm, I'm also a supporter of Peter the Rock, but, but I think I I admire Thomas. And um, as, as you as you, you, you stated, so I think the bishops basically agreed with that. They could have disagreed too. So uh, again, thanks uh, thanks to to them. But I, I see it as that we really need to 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 have people in that tradition of Thomas Aquinas, saint and scholar. But also, this is very challenging. <laughs> it's a very challenging thing to be at once a saint and a scholar. And that is why, to me, I do not use the fact of training saints and scholars as, as one that must be in one person, because it's, it's still, I'm not saying that you, you can devoid, but uh, that they should necessarily be separate. But I'm also proud if I see people who follow in the tradition of maybe Vianney as ex-students of, of St. Thomas Aquinas, who maybe they're not as intellectually strong as a Thomas, but who are very morally and pastorally strong. I think to me, you don't have to be both. You could just be one and still be faithful to to, <laughs> to that I, tradition. That's the way I see it. <laughs> I, I think that in a certain sense is controversial with you saying that. I mean, yeah. I, I, I came in from uh, John uh, Meriviani's uh, spiritual center. Mm -hmm. uh, let's try the uh, Bauer again before. Bro, Luis, can you say something? Can you hear us now? I'm sorry about all the technical problems you're having. Can you hear us? I'm back. Yeah. Okay. So, can you just introduce yourself and tell us about your experience with uh, Thomas Aquinas? In yeah, I I ran from school to come and participate in the program. Like one of it is uh, I want to be very very optimistic. Instead, uh, you know, we are trained to be priests and we are trained to be confessors. And the heart of the confessor is what we understand. We never left the seminary. We never left the seminary. Are you getting me? Yes, we are getting you. That's why my asking. name. I'm Louis Bauer. I'm an engineer. I'm seeing a lady of Lourdes. I left. I left the Thomas Aquinas Seminary in 1994. I entered 1988. Um, uh, I think that the seminary have never left me after leaving. So I think that it's haunting me. When I read the poem of Francis Thompson, an ex man, the Hound of Heaven. Oh my God, Luis! I'm so sorry. The, yeah, the, the connection is, uh, is a problem, <laughs> yeah. and 
I would have loved to continue get. I also saw Brother James, James Song. James, are you on? You seem to have uh, turned off your mic and your phone. I don't know, but if you're on, can you come on and introduce yourself? Okay, Brother James also is having a problem there, but Brother James can understand. So while you were away, uh, Professor Songu said something about Bambui, you know, the mixture of training saints and scholars is kind of too tight and it's difficult. And so maybe it's better to be either a saint or to be a scholar. Some are scholars and those who want to follow the model of uh, John Meriviani can become good pastors, even though if they're not. So, I mean, but before I come to you, Prof, I wanted you to share your own experience, uh, Prof, because in the years when you were in the seminary, how was Thomas Aquinas really made prominent? I mean, like I said, in our days it was different, but I don't know, maybe in your time there, there was something else. No, I don't think it was made prominent. I uh, I, I think the prominence came from the class with with, with, with Pepe Bush <laughs> when, he, when he, he, he repeated many times to us how uh, great uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas was and he would shake his head and would be like, mm -mm. Oh, that man, eh? you can never be like him. Just You just have to bow your head to that man. <laughs> so apart from that, I don't think that as a seminary we 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 did much, but I would I remember that on, I don't know whether it was all the years, but at least once on the Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, they would have a lecture. There was a, an Aquinas lecture. I don't know whether it was a one-time thing or all, but the one that stands uh, that I can remember was uh, uh, the late uh, Father, Father, um, um, the Which one who was killed. killed. I'm just sorry. Uh, Ponte? No. Uh, Patrick Adeso? Father Patrick Adeso presented a rather detailed paper. That's the one. And I, to tell you the truth, I don't think he's, I don't remember the details, but I just remember the, 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 the fact that he did and he went into domestic philosophy and all that. That was the one time that I know, but there was not, uh, I don't think there was a, uh, a, a conscious uh, uh, endeavor to, prom to promote, uh, uh, to promote, let me call it the spirit of Aquinas. However, as, as uh, Professor Ngalim has said, the whole philosophy was all Aquinas. <laughs> it was all Aquinas, or, or at least Thomistic, which is, in the tradition of Aquinas, so in a sense, uh, I would be I would be wrong to say that they were not. But it was not like really. Uh, I mean, you just had if you uh, agreed with the philosophy, then you were just a Thomist and indirectly, <laughs> indirectly a supporter of uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas. I, I mean, I did I, I do disagree with with a few not uh, like this. Yeah, disagree. Let me let me not be scared of that word. I do disagree with a few things, and I don't think that's the topic for today. We're just thinking, but um, uh, uh, especially some of the epistemological uh, 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 approaches to to thing, to knowledge, and all those type of thing. I'm, I'm more of Karl Popper when it comes to epistemology, <laughs> which we did not study in Bambui. Again, we did not not even the name. The name was not even mentioned, but but. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm more of popper when it comes to epistemology. But all in all, uh, yep, let me end there. Let me not monopolize. <laughs> so th thank you, uh, Prof. And let me come. You guys are having a challenge there, uh, Dr. Ngalima. I think uh, technology yep. can run the problem. Uh, Talato says, happy anniversary to Stamps and a great celebration to the great minds molded in that campus. Thank you very much, uh, Talato. Uh, so, Prof, again, the question for me is, I mean, you have already said it, and uh, have, uh, Prof. JJ, thank you for saying that even though Thomas Aquinas, you didn't have Thomas Aquinas written on every wall, but the spirit of Thomas Aquinas was, I mean, permeated at least the philosophy department. And I think currently there is a statue of Thomas Aquinas in the seminary, and that's something good. Wow. But, but Professor Galim, now you, you with hindsight, yes. If you had to go back to redesign things in the seminary, in the spirit of Thomas Aquinas, what would you, what do you think the seminary should do to at least highlight the spirit of Thomas Aquinas and even beyond? Okay. Um, uh, your question presumes that I will have 
put Thomas Aquinas as the model for Bamboo Seminary then. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that's what your question presumes. So, um, uh, yes. Let me, let me answer that question. Yes. Bowie, go ahead. Oh, Bowie. Doctor, let me answer that question. Let's, before let's, let's, take, let's take Bowie so that because his connection, will, we have not heard him. Sorry, Prof. Go ahead. Dr. Uh, Ngalim. Yes. Dr. Ngalim. Let me answer that question. Let's go, go on. Ahead. That question is very pertinent. Yes, yeah, just I go on. on. Go on. I will, on I will teach them jurisprudence. Ju jurisprudence means that, yes, Dr. Ngalim is right. I will teach them jurisprudence. Jurisprudence of Th the jurisprudence of Thomas Aquinas means common sense philosophy, common sense theology. Means that you live, you are trained people to live according to the, the society, not true ideal. So Dr. Ngalim is right. If you send me there, I will, I'm talking before the light go off again. Uh, <laughs> and there the light went off. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, brother. I, I, I did. Go ahead. Yes, I think he's he's going back to the he, he's going back to the question of uh, practical wisdom, phrenesis, that is uh, knowledge that is is lived, knowledge that is lived. You know, I I said Thomas Aquinas is falls within the school of realists, perpetuating the the realism of uh, the metaphysics of Aristotle. That is where truth is independent of the mind. Truth as experienced, as lived not as speculated and, and, and in the mind. So um, I think that's what Bawe is trying to emphasize, but he has some other details that he's saying. But uh, Brother Lambert, I said your question presumes that I would really recommend Thomas Aquinas as a model for stamps. That don't be standing, I'm not in any way negating the efforts of the bishops and the choice of Thomas Aquinas, who is an, a great angelic doctor, a scholar and a saint. But if I were asked to redo or to redesign Bamboo, I would be Afrocentric in my approach. I'll be very Afrocentric. And I would challenge some of the, 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 the things. I mean, I, I, I like to knock the status quo and see progress happening. I like to see things, even research approach. I would like to see it differently in the, in the milieu of the seminary. Yeah, so, um, yeah uh, Professor Ngalim, that's, um, that's insightful. <laughs> it's insightful again, uh, uh, brother Luis Bawe. Is back, but this is back. You wanted to finish up your thought, yep, before uh, coming. Bawe, you are talking, uh, oh, please. I'm not only in Bameda, I'm in Tarekul, it's all and all. <laughs> so, uh, the concept of jurisprudence, I think, yeah, uh, Dr. Ngalim, I'm sorry for cutting short. Let me give you like and go anytime. You, you are right, Dr. Ngalim was right because the concept of jurisprudence precludes the idea of incarnation. If Jesus became a Cameroonian, he would have incarnated in the reality. So when we're teaching people in Bamboo, according to uh, Thomas Aquinas' concept of jurisprudence, let us train to defeat the society, not people who are going to, trans, to, to live about the society. Sometimes Bamboo was expecting too much from us in the sense that everything was taken for granted except our errors. Everything was taken for granted except our errors, whereas we are to go in a society full of errors. <laughs> Jurisprudence means that what? You live according to the people. So the pastoral theology, the application of the Summa Theologica was missed there. Imagine me in court, in the village in there, and you are telling me to preach this secondary theology. We are living amid uh, uh, some people cohabiting, and I'm asking He's gone. Yeah, I think even the, the the Thomas Aquinas is not happy that you are talking about the uh, cohabitation in court. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I think Professor Professor yes, wanted okay. to I, want, to I, want, I, was, I wanted to take uh, Professor Galim. I mean, more or less to compliment him. I like uh, an Afrocentric approach, but in uh, myself as an indiv uh, I mean, uh, as an individual, I I have learned to be more of. Uh, an eclectic uh, human being, even though I'm proud to be African, but I do not limit myself with Africa. I do not limit myself to Africa and I'm willing to embrace anything from anywhere that makes 
sense or that makes uh, life better. But still, though, I give sometimes I give like what we call in liberation theology a preferential, <laughs> the preferential treatment. Uh, or, uh, yep. So I have a preference for Africa if the, the choice is. And that tells you that's why when I started St. Monica, the name is not an accident. It's not an accident. So first of all, I wanted to call the, the University St. Augustine because I thought that was the most uh, widely known uh, African. widely known African saint uh, who towers, in a sense, also a saint and scholar. But first, I was like the St. Augustine's College, and I didn't want to, <laughs> to, to fight with that name. But the more to, I'm also a feminist. So people who know me, you probably have heard me say so before. So I was also, I'm also a feminist that believes in women's rights and things like that. Actually, to me, uh, the greatest violation of people's rights is within the Catholic Church is the refusal to ordain women priests. Because how can you disenfranchise half of your population or more than half of your, your population? It refuse them the, the opportunity for leadership. To me, it's not, it's not acceptable. I mean, I mean, I have no choice to, for it, but if I had to vote, that, that is unacceptable that you disenfranchise more than 50% of your, your membership. I think Thomas Aquinas would have had a problem with you saying that. Yeah, that's what I told you the, the, before the that I'm not, the yeah, fact that I, I like him doesn't mean that I agree with everything. Yeah. Okay, so I, I took, I, as a feminist, so I was really moving for Augustine, but then I told myself that without Monica, there would have been no Augustine. There would have been no Augustine. He was physically the mother, but even the, the religious influence of Augustine came from the mother. And so, like, we, they sometimes refer to schools as Ama Mata, uh, that's mother's care. So I was like, you know what? Uh, Monica is really <laughs> the person I should be. I should be doing that and giving tribute to her contribution to that. So even in my school, there were times we celebrated both the feast of Saint Augustine and the feast of Saint Monica. And I saw them, but I, could, I didn't want to name the school something. But I'm just saying. So yes, I do agree. I mean, I, uh, if I had, if as I said, if it was not Thomas, I would be Augustine. But I'm at home with Thomas. <laughs> right, so but when you're, uh, but at least you're back, you wanted to finish your thought before the lights go off again. And just to know that one of your best uh, friends is on, uh, Dr. Nicholas Starr. Luis is a powerful big brother. I admire him so much. And he also says, um, I was really enjoying his train of thought. So he's enjoying it. So go on before you go off again. <laughs> and there he's gone. So, Dr. Ngalim, you, you, now you talk about this... Yes. Uh, uh, being Afrocentric, isn't it? And I'm wondering, yes. is, uh, is Thomas Aquinas not Afrocentric? Um, uh, okay, my own concept, I, I, I prefer to use Afri, Afri, because Afrocentric okay. is, is the same European, okay? Um, okay? I'm not saying that Thomas Aquinas is not Afrocentric. My point is, I admire the values perpetrated by Thomas Aquinas in his own context and at this time, they, some of them are relevant to us here, very, very relevant, especially in the seminary. But then we have to make them to, to, to we have to bring them to bear fruits in, uh, in life. That's what Bauer was trying to bring up. That is a return to the Lebensvelt. That one he was talking about. To the lived world, what we experience, a return to the Lebensvelt. And he, remember, and what he says corroborates the paper I was presenting during the the launching of the of, of the Saint Benedict Institute, where I said the dialogue between Afri African Christian philosophy and Christianity has to be horizontal. The dialogue has to be horizontal and not vertical. And I, I gave examples with regard to the Christian to the values in African traditional religion, which could really inform the way Christianity is planted in Africa. That is the approach in which Bambui has to function. Even the approach to research, as I said, even the type of research that is done and the way it is done, there is a, there is a reason to go beyond what we see there now and improve on things. Yeah. So again, yeah, just, if, uh, if, so just, just, on the, just hang on one okay. second, JJ. I just wanted to, for, to, because you unpack two or three things you said there. What's the difference between 
Afrocentric and Afrocentric. And just to point out to you that, again, I know, I know the answer, hold on, the answer you're going to give to that. You go back to use Lebensfeld, which is a German concept, isn't it? That's not an African concept. Yes. So why are you Afrocentric mm -hmm. and telling us about the Lebensfeld? But go ahead, make that distinction. No, I'm, to... yes. I, I, am, I am using Lebensfeld in context because it is... It is it is it, it is a, a a phenomenological concept that has a, a serious bearing within the practice of African values, especially with ideas that are transplanted. So they bear fruit within. The, that, that, it, it is about the return to what to the world that we, the Africans, we experience from where we extract our essences of things. We cannot reflect about another world apart from the world in which we experience. Professor, uh, Lucy, I was saying that Afro yes, yeah, go ahead. Lucy is there. Go ahead. Lucy is Afrocentric, I was making a decision because Afrocentric because Afrocentric is the package given to us from the West. So we, but changing Africa to Afro, so I, I, we are maintaining Afrocentric. I am taking it after Professor Barman Samena, who said we should maintain it as Afri and not consider the package given by the West. Okay, well, Professor Song, we had something. Do you think you wanted to push back on something? No, not a pushback. I, I just wanted to say that um, uh, at least the Bambui of my days, um, uh, to me, it, uh, it was a mixed package, like every other thing is. <laughs> so <laughs> that is not that is not strange. But um, one of the people that I, especially after I leave, but I think I had an admiration for him when we were in Bambui. But the the common uh, trend then was to laugh at him. It was Father Henry Dinayen <laughs> who taught uh, enculturation and all that. And I had a lot of admiration, but for some reason, maybe it was almost like people were older than me when we came. Some people, they called him Akumo. They generally laughed and all that. And for some reason, I never really understood, but I admired the guy a lot. I admire him a lot. And to me, he's probably the closest to be the scholar that I saw in my days. Maybe not, I don't know about the saint. I mean, I, I, I have nothing wrong with him. I don't know. I mean, he was my teacher and I just saw him like that. I don't have any moral judgment to pass on, on him. But from the scholarly part, he was probably the only scholar we had in those days. He created uh, the Cameroon Ecclesia Review, even though to me it was a simplistic uh, uh, renaming of the African Ecclesia Review. You could be more creative than that, but that notwithstanding uh, 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 the lack of creativity in that this thing, but I thought that he was phenomenal in that he created a magazine that had no support. This guy would print it in his, with his small olden day computer. <laughs> you print it in his room. He was doing everything. He was a publisher. He would write those type of things. And I I admired him, but a few times I see people just laugh at me and say, oh, Akumo, Akumo. But basically, I think he was one of the guys who would, I hope, uh, 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 fall on what, uh, I mean, follow what Professor Ngalim is saying, that he really tried to bring enculturation. I don't know what happened after or even before, because I happened to have come in just around the time of him coming in, but he brought a big influence on uh, on uh, the, the concept of enculturation and all that. And I bought into the concept too of enculturation. Actually, I was one of those who did not really buy into this new revival movement. I'm not a, a shouting guy and dancing guy, but <laughs> I mean, the sense of this thing, uh, this revival uh, spirit that has even entered the Catholic Church today. But I'm, I, I buy his enculturation, and I agree. I'm not. I do not disagree with uh, Professor Galim. They need to Africanize uh, uh, the church. And by the way, uh, talking about Africanization and the African Ecclesia Review, uh, it was African Ecclesia Review was actually being led by a British. Uh, priest, I've just forgotten his name, uh, but he was led by a British priest, but you could not be more African than, than African Ecclesia Review. So to me, it doesn't matter where ideas came from. And uh, uh, I remember when the Pope was coming to Cameroon in, 90, in 95 years to, to launch the, uh, the Ecclesia in Africa, 
the African, uh, he wrote an, uh, the article, I've just forgotten the, uh, that uh, the guy's name, he wrote an article which is stayed cooked in a Roman pot. <laughs> so that they were coming to talk about Africa, but all the ideas were made up from Rome and all that. I agree with some, disagree with others, but I'm just saying, Bamboy was it was a really academic center for all his weaknesses and all that. Like uh, basically, we had only two teachers, uh, a, a, a faculty, full time faculty in philosophy. But these guys, they worked, they, they worked really hard, and and all that. I don't think, and it, it, uh, I mean, he had his weakness, had, but I think that people were good hearted, and I think the more I get as I get older, I'm giving more respect to many of those. Uh, people, including, let me shout, I don't know whether Father Dinayan is anywhere. Yes. <laughs> shout out to him. I think, to me, he was one of those people that, one of the forgotten giants hey. of days. Bro, bro Asongo, mm -hmm. I just, please, I just team a generator. Please, let me say something, what they are saying. Yeah. Bro Asongo, give me a chance for let go again. Yes, go, <laughs> go, Bowen, please go. Go. I bet, you, I bet you say something for the night. I want to beg you, Luis. Just go. Every time you come on, just go. No, you don't wait for anybody. We'll stop because we know you have oh. challenges. Go. I think he's frozen. Yep. He's yeah. muted. Yes, I think he's okay. Luis, uh, go ahead. Okay, while he's figuring out, but Dr. Ngalima, I had, I had a question for you because, again, my pushback to your. Uh, 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 Afrocentrism is the fact that the, the seminary needs to follow a certain pattern in terms of standardization, isn't it? So in order for people to get degrees or get certificates that are recognized, yes, yes. and the problem we have with most of, well, not most, some of the things we are calling Afrocentric is they don't fit within those categories. So how do you balance that out? No, it is, in fact, uh, science remains science. Eh? We, have to, we, we have to sell them. And when we sell them, we, when we sell them to the world, and we can justify this following sci scientific canons, then they will be standardized. There are theories coming up from the African worldview. There are many theories coming up and they are being standardized. And if, if African scientists did not take the efforts to dare into this, then we, uh, I, I would corroborate for Lon who says that we prefer those who try and fail than those who fail to try. Correct. So I find that interesting. But again, I think that we, we have a long way to go. And let me, because you, you talk about it and we are supposed to really focus on that. Which saint... I think yeah. Professor Songo has already told us yes. he would have been in St. Augustine or St. Monica if he had to rename the seminary for him that would have been the way. But for you, Professor Ngali, yes. which saint would you have chosen? And let yes. me also see that before you, uh, Professor Songo gave us a little history that Thomas Aquinas was actually chosen by the students, not even the bishops. And that was interesting. That's an interesting nugget. But I'm asking, remember, yes. because when I was looking at it, the seminary was opened in 1973. That was right after Vatican II had really yes. just closed up, isn't it? So five five years. And Thomas Aquinas was yes. like a central figure in, in Vatican II. Okay? If you go back to uh, Optatum Tochi, the document on priestly formation from Vatican II, they actually spell it there that seminaries should study Thomas Aquinas. So I'm not surprised that, again, people had to go to that. But what is surprising is Paul VI had come in and canonized the matters of Uganda, isn't it? In, I think it's 1968, if I'm not mistaken. And so one would have thought that mm -hmm. African bishops would have been looking towards Uganda as a paradigm. And I'm thinking that maybe the matters of Uganda would have been the ones that you would have chosen to name the seminary after, not giving you any, any uh, not nudging you anyway, but what would have been your preference? Okay, yeah, no. Um, um, with the choice of the students with regard to Thomas Aquinas, I think the type of knowledge presented to them 
the environment, the culture will have warranted them choosing Thomas Aquinas. Because in, even in our days, the way we were brought up in the same scenario and taught, we would have chosen Thomas Aquinas then. But with the matters of Uganda, as you are saying, um, uh, I think the, the martyrdom, the, 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 the martyrdom doesn't bring that, uh, the, the, the scholarship, because Thomas Aquinas is coming on from two perspectives, sainthood and scholarship, as Professor Asungo already said, sainthood and scholarship. So, and that's a pick presented by the seminary. But I would have looked at, you know, the problem is that we have to go through these standards of having people be accepted as saints. But we also have some of the examples in Africa, even in Cameroon, even in the ecclesiastical province, that the seminary could be taken after. Because the seminary in Cameroon would not leave the values of the medieval era. Because at the moment, I think the seminary is still in the medieval era and they have to go beyond. Because after the medieval era, you know the reaction of the Renaissance was because the medieval era was seen by the Renaissance as a Aristotelian was Your line is breaking up, uh, Prof. I don't know, maybe you want to... And we have to be able to have what to learn from it, but we learn the values that we can take. Hello? Hello? Yes, yes. Your line was breaking up. Hello? Can you hear us? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting you. Yeah, go ahead. Your line, you were, you were talking about the Renaissance period after um, the medieval period. So you were saying that's what we're, you we're breaking up. Yes, I was saying that the Renaissance was a reaction to the medieval period because they saw the medieval period as a collection of standardized errors. Everything that was said, everything Aristotelian was accepted as the gospel truth without challenging these ideas. And the Renaissance came to challenge these. So I think we also, though there is much to learn from these values put down by Thomas Aquinas, but then we need to go beyond these. The present seminary in Cameroon should reflect the standards left behind by Blessed Vedrikov, left for long, left beside by good examples like uh, Samson Yi and Soba Toibara. So I am glad you have now taken us full circle to where you would have, uh, and um, again, you have already started the process of beatification for Blessed uh, uh, Bezekov. <laughs> and I just wanted to plug in there that, um, let's answer one question, and, and I think it's a fundamental error in Bambui. I wrote about this some years ago when I left the seminary, because the philosophy department in the seminary at the time that we came in, we had... Uh, uh, Father Polika Fonjok, may he rest in peace. But after that, we got mm -hmm. Father Michael Suniba. Okay? And then a few years after, we got Christian Mofo. But these are big names in philosophy in, at least within the walls of Bambui. We don't, I don't know why there has not been an endowed chair for, for, non, for uh, a person like Christian Mofo. Or well, one, even I know Father Michael Nibai is still living, isn't it? We have failed in terms of produce. We are, we have these minds that have a lot to to uh, call it deliver, but the seminary has not taken advantage of its own products in order to make sure that it flourishes. So look at a simple one like the magazine that is produced by the seminary, Searchlight. We don't find it getting that prominence whereby people can really take it up as a place where those ideas can be fleshed out. You want to look at a good journal. You want to reference a uh, search like the professors are not writing, the students are not writing, and you are looking at everybody's just doing some funny things. So my, my basic question is, give me Dr. JJ, if you had to, in the 50 years of Bambui, if you had the opportunity to canonize a saint, you have already given us one for a scholar, that is uh, for the... Uh, for the Inayen. Inayen. Who are the, some of the saints that you have seen who are followed up that you would say, these are people that I think? 
you know, we should be looking at. And I know you already gave us your rector, <laughs> and for that denying, but outside those, who else would you be asking us to look at? Well, in, in uh, I think th th uh, there are many uh, good people. Unfortunately, after I left Bambui, I literally left the country. <laughs> so I, I don't have a, a daily contact with the people. And again, uh, it's difficult to pass a judgment on a moral judgment or a saint judgment on people that uh, you've not known. And people do change and all those type of things. So honestly, with all humility, I would say that I cannot propose any other people and uh, any other names. And even the people that I name, maybe the later change, I don't know, as we, we all know, change is the only constant, so to say. So it, it, things, things could have changed. But as I said, from in my days, I really thought that uh, especially when I look back, uh, again, I, I didn't have, I, I don't remember any moral frailty on the part of uh, Father Dinayen. He was not even particularly, uh, I wasn't particularly close to him, but I had some secret admiration for his publication. So to me, he stands more like the scholar uh, who had, uh, who suffered that he had no institutional support to, 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 to help him uh, do that. The school could have embraced it. I don't know whether he's the one who refused to or they just did not. But I think uh, if he had more institutional support, uh, maybe today the Cameroon Ecclesia Review or maybe Ambazonia Ecclesia Review should have... Uh, should have been <laughs> what uh, what would uh, I mean would have been a veritable uh, publication and I just think that along that line there are many other people I do agree that Fonlon is uh, for all what I know I think I met him only once in real life but for all that I know he looks like uh, and the writings and everything looks like definitely a saint uh, as well as uh, Vedzekov too uh, 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 with his extremes. <laughs> I mean, I think that he, he had, and everybody has almost every sense. There's some sense of uh, uh, you have some eccentric characteristics in you. So I, I felt like uh, what I knew about uh, the the late Archbishop was like he could be swift in action, and sometimes those actions were not as informed as you would otherwise. <laughs> you otherwise want them to 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 be. But beyond that, the idea is what informed that thing he really came from a pure heart in my view i may be wrong that they came the, uh, from a sincere effort to to do good so i think so but the other comment i just want to make is that at the time they were starting there's this tradition of not really honoring the living i'm not against it so i guess those names would not have come into play when they were choosing the, the name because uh, probably they would have been looking at the dead. Uh, the interesting one is is in Nigeria. I don't know if you have ever thought about it. Bigard Memorial Seminary. Bigard was actually named after somebody who contributed money to start this <laughs> to start this a, a couple that contributed money to to start the the seminary. So. Uh, yeah. So I mean, we don't have to f fall into any more. And by the way, it was a Western person. It was it was it was not an African. So for me, as much as we want to think that we are Africans, I just think that for me, I'm generally in my philosophy, I'm eclectic in my uh, approach to 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 worldview. It, my worldview is actually a worldview. It's not it's not a, an Afri or Afro view and all that. So I'm the type of guy that maybe I may be telling you that I love this thing in Asia and I love this in Latin America and I love this in America and I love this in Europe. That's me. Yeah, we could already we could already tell because again, yeah, like, oh. I, I have avoided two things to mention here. There was a trend when we got into the seminary that you guys have started off the yep. free thinkers and the liberation yep. theologians. Those two things are the things yep. that you guys in trouble. So we know that uh, again within that context, if you ever talk to JJ, you would have heard some of those kind of you know those. JJ is going to tell you some things in some far flung places. Liberation <laughs> theology is something that nobody wants to hear. Uh, even Ratzinger, you know, uh, Pope Benedict had a problem with the uh, Gutierrez and the rest from Latin America. But yeah. uh, Professor Galin, um, so yes, we talked. We talked a little bit, and again, I, I was thinking, 
within the by the way i put this up and I, I, when i saw Luis Bawe, I, I that took me off so nico says i love these guys from jj and from gallon good job it is clear that we're listening to scholars here the depth of thought is unquestionable and the scholarly language power is evident this dialogue reminds me of the famous debate we had in the seminary when professor christian mofo returned from switzerland and again that is where i really wanted to go with with this because i think that in a certain sense, in 50 years, Bambui has enough resources from within that they should be able to like pull together and make the place a veritable place. Because I also note that during the Silver Jubilee in the seminary, of uh, the seminary, there was a debate between Christian Mofo and um, Father Hong Tata, you know, and it was on something that had to do with African tradition. And you could see the passion because, again, I don't know what school of thought uh, Christian Mofo, uh, for, uh, may he rest in peace. He was a real philosopher who had really studied. But, Luis, if you are on, you, you want to say something? Please. Let me stop. Uh, Lam Brother Lambert, I'm on now. I just got go. a generator. I just keep my generator. Go, go. You want to say something? Go ahead. Hmm. Brother Luis, can you hear us? Talk, Luis. Yeah, I'm on. Go ahead. Talk. I don't got it. I don't got my generator on. Okay. I don't so get Luis... my generator on now, so I'm on. Yeah. <laughs> if you had to talk about uh, saints and scholars, uh, from am I am I on? Yes, yes. you are. Yes. I am saying the way you talk about ecclesia in Africa. I remember Thomas Aquino of jurisprudence. That day. Eh? Go, go, go. We are listening. The concept of jurisprudence of Thomas Aquinas was applied in Ecclesia in Africa. I will not give you an anecdote. The, how the Pope interpreted the Good Samaritan story is African. Okay, so how the Pope interpreted the Good Samaritan in Ecclesia in Africa is African. That's what Bauer is saying, and he, he went off. And if you read that, um, it's one of those central pieces in Ecclesia in Africa, isn't it? Where the uh, the Pope is asking who those thieves are, isn't it? <laughs> who are the bandits who actually uh, are robbing Africa? You know, it's kind of, kind of very, very... And I think Bauer is onto something there. Uh, but Prof, let's come to you. I don't know. Luis really has a problem. I think next time, what we may have to do is gather you guys in Cameroon in one spot so that we can move around. And I think it will be better off. We can look for a data center because this would have been more interactive. Okay. I really, I really regret the fact that Luis is having this problem, and we can do it in a better way. But Prof, I, I mean, in the remainder of the time that we have this, we we have gone on for an hour. I just wanted to uh, pull pull all of this together. You were taught, I mean, give me, I, I may be wrong, but you you were taught by uh, Father Christian Mofo, may he rest in peace. And yes. I'm, I'm, yes. I'm wondering, what of Christian Mofo would you say uh, was really influenced by Thomas Aquinas? What is his philosophy? Okay, where do you think that you would you situate Thomas Aquinas within that philosophy? Um, um, I think that in the first place, I would like to clarify that Christian Mofo had a Plotinian bent of philosophy. A Plotinian bent of philosophy is coming from Plato more and not from Aristotle. Though he, he was able to navigate between all these thinkers. And um, yes, he, 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 he believed in knowledge of the classics, which is also celebrated in medieval thinkers. In Thomas Aquinas, um, when you look at the philosophical train of, and research of Father Christian Mofo, you will not see so much of domestic philosophy. You will see more of Plato and Plotinus because Plotinus is, is, is a new Platonist. And, um, and he took that direction. And Christian Mofo, he, he, in fact, that is one of the, the, the lecturers in Bamboo who made a telling influence in my academic uh, perspective because he was able to blend two things in pedagogy. That is rigor and humor. He was able to blend rigor and humor. And these two things, because when you think that there was rigor in class, he was able to bring humor at the same time. And these things gave life to class that you could sit for four hours without really uh, 
uh, provo uh, very provocative, but still within the stern discipline of the medieval era in the seminary, which I very much uh, regret that they were able to do that. I, I, in fact, uh, one of the, the one of the failures in Bamboo was that stern discipline of the medieval era that they inherited, and and I think this is what Thomas Aquinas should have also preached that this is what seminary formation will be all about. Um, but when Christian Movo, he taught me in Bamboo for three years, and then he taught me in the Cali University in Yaoundé for three years. In the Cali University in Yaoundé, he was a different person again. He was a different person. So then uh, he was more of a father and became a mentor. And even right to my PhD, I remember Christian Movo, I used to discuss my PhD studies with him, and he gave different perspectives and the rest. And and that is how it is. And being a different, in, in, in the Cali University in Yaoundé, he was more of a father and very receptive. And we no longer saw the discipline in Bamboo. So you saw a, a certain progress in a person's personality. So change, with regard to the changes in the environment. And I think when he came back, he also he, he, he brought back those values right to the Cali University of Cameroon in Bamela. So people saw him too as a different person. So you see, that's why I was talking about the culture in Bamboo, which was really a, a perpetuation of the medieval era and life out of Bamboo. So that's what I can retain about yeah. Father Christian Mo Mofo. Yeah, but, but, but talking about culture, every culture is, um, every culture is unique. Even when you talk about culture of an institution and everything is unique and is shaped by all types of forces, the students of the day, <laughs> the, the instructors and, and all of that, all of that contribute to the culture. And I would, I mean, I'm not uh, disagreeing with uh, Professor Galim. I'm rather saying that to me, it's obvious that if you are teaching in the seminary, you have to have a different culture of that, of that uh, institution. And if you now move to, uh, to another place, and I've had that challenge too, even trying to set up my own institution. Uh, I came here, studied here, and taught at multiple universities in the uh, in the U.S. Uh, and uh, when I went to 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 build, I had the idea of building an American style school, which I think I've probably given up on it. But <laughs> but um, but the point is that. Uh, when you come to, because of the various factors that are in place, you would realize that you have a much more different person. And I can say that, uh, uh, I can say that if you are training priests, you will ask more of people who want to become priests than of people who just want to become <laughs> like, 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 like intellectuals, like. scholars. So I, I mean, so even without. It doesn't sound to me as any contradiction at all. I'm not saying that he said it was, but it, it just sounds to me normal that the same person, if you put him to, in the seminary, should behave differently because the, the goals of the seminary are different. And then if you put him in a regular university, he should behave differently. Maybe not behave, but I mean, you understand what I'm trying to say. The approach should be a little different. Yeah, so again, even with... Uh, um, uh, Father Christian Mo for being, uh, may he rest in peace. Um, I think that there's something about synthesis in Thomas Aquinas, being able to synthesize the reason and faith, isn't it? If you mm -hmm. go back to um, Fides et Ratio, which yeah. is a, 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 a deeply Thomistic document, it's a whole section there on, on, on Thomas Aquinas, isn't it? But I, I find that for me, one of the greatest benefits of having gone through Bambui um, within the Thomistic tradition is a certain ability to synthesize. You know, it's never just either or, you know, but being able to bring the both and, which is a truly Catholic thing. And within, within, within our circles, I believe that once you want to go down that straight road, you know, it becomes a problem. And I know that the, the, the seminary, like Professor Songo is saying, has that tendency of rigor. And I'm glad uh, Professor Ngalim is able to show that there was some humor. And I think that that is what I also learned being under the tutelage of a man like Father John Ambe, the rector at that time, and some of us survived that long in the seminary just because we had Father John Ambe. If there were others, would have gone long before that. 
But that was because of that. So again, within the tradition of the, that, because I look at him more, uh, Thomas Aquinas for me is being able to synthesize, isn't it? And that approach, the scholastic approach, isn't it? Questioning. He's, we look at the Summa, isn't it? The way the Summa is structured, I think that is why people look at some of us and think that we question things too much, isn't it? And we want to over philosophize. It's a problem even on our ex seminars WhatsApp forum that people think to say we want to question everything, but that's also because of that tradition. Beyond that questioning, I think is how we synthesize that's the problem. That lack of that ability to synthesize even after you break down the thesis, the antithesis, and bring that together, I believe is something that we all want to, to take away from, from Thomas Aquinas. As a Christian, but, I think my personal life, for me, Thomas Aquinas uh, impacted me in my ability to question and then look for answers and see how to synthesize. And for, that's the greatest thing. And to the question then, uh, one last, because that's a, that was our topic for today. Do you think Thomas Aquinas was a veritable patron saint for the regional major seminary? I can tell, I mean, JJ Asong, Professor Asongu, what is your answer before I come to you? Then we'll have some last uh, closing remarks. Well, I think I'd already answered, yes. Uh, I mean, there could have been other choices, maybe Augustine, as I've said, or this thing, but to me, I'm perfectly at home with that. With, with that. And of course, Professor Ngalim. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. It was, it, it was a good choice at the time. It was a good choice at the time, yes. But if a new seminary has to come up, we, we also want to see other perspectives. Right, so, and so let me end up by asking you, Professor Ngalim, and this is more for us like ex-seminarians, um, what impact do you think as ex-seminarians we should be able to bring to our local church, to our own environment in terms of, I mean, I, I know you don't, I mean, I don't want to say you're not a thomist, uh, that's, too, that's too wide, that's too broad uh, a stroke, but how do you think we should be able to get through and I'm looking at it and maybe Dr. Ty is already putting that in there, what impact do you think as ex seminarians we should be able to bring to our environment? Um, um, uh, in fact, we have to contribute to the environment from many perspectives. We look, I will just look at it from the three perspectives of development, human development, which means that we, 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 we should constitute the intelligentsia. We should constitute the intelligentsia and contribute to human development from all perspectives. There is so much to say with regard to that. We should also contribute to economic development. We should be able to produce wealth, like people who, have, who constitute a strong thinking tank, to be able to, 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 to produce and improve on the living conditions of the people. Yes? And apart from that, then we should also contribute to sustainable development from all, yeah? Be it the respect of the environment and in all forms from different approaches that we could make. Could be scientific research, could be other things we should be. And then we are collaborators to the church. And this is where I think the church has not understood. We are very great collaborators to the church and we have so much to offer to the church. If um, uh, I'm looking forward to activities that is marking the 50th anniversary, we shall be producing perspectives of how the Bamboo Seminary should be. I see the Bamboo Seminary more now like a faculty of theology and not just a seminary. It should go beyond the seminary and become a faculty of theology and let seminarians stay in hotel and hostels and attend classes in a university, in a faculty, with other lay people who have the who, who also want to study theology and the rest. Thank you. That's a great, that's a great one. And I love uh, the, the I love the fact of being an intelligence. And I really want to say that when we left the seminary, I left the seminary in 1999. Um, I think at the time. 1999, I don't know of any other uh, ex-major seminarian apart from when I came over and met uh, Dr. J.J. Song, uh, Songu here in the United States in 2004. You know, the only person we knew at the time was George Yenika, isn't it? Everybody talked about George. He had left the seminary and was a successful guy, Was uh, became a bank manager in Limbe, you know, and all that, and it's now with EWT and all that. But now, there are many of ex-seminarians from Bambui who are within academia, isn't it? Professor uh, Valentine has Dr. Nelson Shang. There are a couple of them who all have graduated with uh, degrees in, 
in education, Dr. Mbong Wong, Dr. Moses Lafngwa, many people. Psychology. Yes, psychology of education, mm -hmm. Dr. Ta here, he is uh, in cybersecurity, Dr. J.J. Asongu, many, many. And I think that it is time for us to really put ourselves together like we have done over the last three years and make use of that so that we can become real agents of change, be the intelligentsia, but not just in the words of James Cole, if that too much knowledge is not putting money in your pocket, then it's useless. Isn't it? <laughs> so we must we must now strive to make sure that the knowledge we have gained also helps us to put money in our pockets. And I love that fact you talked about. Yeah, that's what I Producing yeah. wealth. Can, that's yes. very important. Mr. Moderator, before you end, let, let me cite some two things that really influenced me after I left Bamboo. Right. And I, I went to study in Nigeria. First, I stopped... I stopped uh, at the University of Calabar. I mean, I stopped in Calabar, yep, specifically University of Calabar because my sister then was a student at the university. So on my way to, I was trying to get admission in Ibadan. But I ended, I, I first stopped just, my first stop was Calabar. I arrived on a Saturday and the next day was a Sunday. So I went to church, uh, university chapel, and I, I've forgotten all what was said and whatever, but what struck me was at the end of the mass, the catechists <laughs> stood up, made some announcements that I did not care to, to remember, but towards the end, he made a comment where he said that, that as Christians, we should try to be examples. That is not saying that people cannot make mistakes, but we should make an effort to lead uh, to, to lead by good example. And so much so that even when you make a mistake, somebody could appreciate that mistake and all that. I saw people stood up and they gave him a standing ovation. I don't even know what he started. I just, that, that was the end comment. But people stood up and gave the catechist a standing ovation. So when I left, I was like, wow, what is this? I was told that guy was an ex-seminarian and uh, he, he was actually a PhD student, but he was volunteering as a, uh, he was volunteering as the catechist for the, for the uh, university Catholic community. And they told me that that guy, everybody was like, he's a blemish, that they listen to him, they respect him more than the priest. So that struck me. I then also went to University of, uh, of Lagos and... While I was there, uh, I met one guy, uh, one professor. Actually, both people have even forgotten their names, but I used to remember that name. I mean, I cannot think of... Uh, they cut a kiss. I don't even remember. I don't think I ever remembered his name, but it, this other professor, if I forget. So he was actually head of the philosophy department of, at the University of, uh, of, uh, of Lagos. And behold, of course, like many of these people, he was an ex-seminarian. So one day, I heard people call him a saint. They were like, this guy, this man, that you cannot joke with him and all that. And for some of the rebellion that came with anger, or I don't know, anybody can have their own, but like the frustration of leaving Bamboo and being like, you know what, these things do not matter again. Those two, they were like, they were God sent to me. <laughs> they reminded me that, that, uh, that uh, this thing that you should be that example. I don't know whether I've been uh, and I'm, I'm, I have my own shortcomings, uh, but that has become uh, th those two people. Even without remembering their names, to me they are my they are my they are my examples. And I hope that uh, this type of thing. I remember meeting an ex seminarian who just not called the name, and this guy was like trying to get me involved into some really on holy stuff. Uh, and I, all what I asked him was that, is that what we studied in Bamboo? Which is the was within my generation. So I'm just saying that, except you've completely, that's me, except you've completely, uh, which is purely respect, respectable. You can disagree with, with your past and disagree even with religion and all that. But if you still hold that value, I think for me, let's take the challenge and be true examples of what we studied and what we believed. Thank you very much. But Dr. Ta, we as ex seminarians are now scholars and parents have a unique seat on the table of debate in the Cameroonian educational and political system. 
Our experiences both in the seminary and the world gives us rare perspectives that should be tapped into to build a better society. I think Great. Yeah. that's something that we should be able to take a topic up and really take that for our next time. But I want to now offer the opportunity for closing comments and I really want to appreciate, I'm sorry, Dr. Lu Brother Luis Bawe has really struggled to be a part of this conversation, so we need to create time for him later just to have that one-on-one. -on -one. And since you are the president, let's. Uh, I want us to take a commitment that this is. Some, I mean, this is on my my channel. I want to make yeah. it open so that we can use this as regularly to celebrate this um, this this jubilee year. Let's see. Yes. Luis, hold on, Brother Luis has just connected again. Um, well, I don't see. Uh, his devices are not okay. Let's hear. Luis, can you say something? We're about to close the show. Say something. Yes. Yes. I will. Talk. I will be very fast. I want to situate it within the context of the Ecclesia in Africa and the Good Samaritan story. Get it very clear. The man who fell was beaten by the thieves. Is Africa. The man on the Good Samaritan who was, sorry, uh, the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan who was beaten is Africa. The thieves are Western civilization, colonialism, disease, ignorance, and bad government. The lawyer that worked and passed by is the Western education that will solve the African problem, and that's the ex -Union. And then the priest that worked and passed by is the church that does not adopt curriculum suit the uh, the African situation and uh, the thing that suit the pastoral decision of African. The good Samaritan is the African wish doctor that comes <laughs> and then takes care of the man. We go to the church and see go back there. So until we deconstruct our curriculum and deconstruct our pedagogy and our homilies to suit the African situation, we will go to the church and see go back to the village. Now we ex with all the philosophy and theology, we are very divided than anybody because we see things tried. Because we see things good Samaritan, we go back to those who solve our problem. We are not talking abstract in the air, you are talking that the fact is that bamboo and jurisprudence was that we solve the problem of the people. Remember that in bamboo, ex don't come back. Even the those who succeed, eh? the priests only go back. Even the priests who are divided, we are trained to be divided. Why? We have not tailored our pedagogy or homiletics or whatever to suit the pastoral necessity of our people. We think Roman, we think abstract. We have never, never really inculturated our theology and philosophy to our people, as Dr. Ngalib is saying. We don't think about ex. Uh, to the, I thought they exhumed the skull of, 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 uh, of Thomas Aquinas. Mm -hmm. But if a Bamlekema exhumed the skull, it would be noise. We don't look at the concrete reality of what we're doing. <laughs> wow. The, the, brother Liz, thank you very much. I hope no, you come back. I was and interested and, yes, uh, and yes. food for thought for another day. Yes. But I, for, for the record, I'm not a witchcraft believer. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, uh, again, Dr. Gali, many last words. And I really think, like I, I was just saying before, Brother Liz came on. I think uh, it's an yeah. opportunity for us. Let's let's make sure we make our voices heard. Make our, oh yes. And Doctor Doctor Professor Asongu felt uh, uh, so I'm surprised he did not mention the first Cameroonian Catholic community in the United States. First Cameroonian Catholic community. Now there are many all over. Yeah. The first one was started here in the Archdiocese of Washington D.C. by ex immigrants from Bambui. I was there. Oh. He, he was the first chairperson of the community. So we want to be on record. We may not be good ex as We have done some good things. Yeah. Excellent. That's why I say we are collaborators of the church. I thank you for this platform and it's going to make us to... Co and this is another uh, venue for us to contribute so much for hum to human development and to even to economic development as well. Thank you very much. And so, yeah, you so thank, thank you. And I just want to declare today is uh, an EFD, an extraordinary free day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a day we always look forward to. Yeah. I want all the brothers, wherever you are, go take a drink, get a drink. Let's um, raise our, our, our glasses, our voices uh, in honor of Thomas Aquinas, in honor of our, our alma mater. And let's continue to celebrate Bamboo. We will take this opportunity to make our voices heard to make sure we can become true collaborators 
produce wealth and become better people. In the absence of anything, I want to say thank you. Thank you for Dr. Ta. I'm going to take you up for our next, uh, next session. But um, this is going to be a constant staple on the menu of this program going forward. Thank you all. Happy Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas. Good afternoon, good evening, and see you next time. Bye. Thanks. Yeah, it was a pleasure.